Which brings me to an interesting observation. For as awful as he is, as dumb, ignorant, inconsiderate, ill-mannered, negligent, and talentless as Aster is, our protagonist Rosemary exhibits much of the same qualities. But whenever she acts like the great zenith of dumbassery that she is, the show presents it as fun and quirky and free-spirited, she never gets into trouble for pulling the exact same shit as Aster. Take a look at these two scenes. One of the characters almost decapitating their classmate is presented as idiotic and evil, no redeeming qualities to them whatsoever, and the other is presented as just being silly. One character exhibits flaws, while another one has mere quirks. One set of rules for V, another set of rules for me. Now which factor might affect the way the author favors one character over the other? What is the obvious difference between these characters? Why does one deserve leniency over the other? I've already touched on this issue here and there, but it's high time we do a proper deep dive. Given the stated agenda of pushing quote diverse characters, and the writing staff's propensity for open misandry, I feel like there's no need to be coy about this. The writers, directors, the team behind this travesty are not making entertainment. They are creating propaganda with the aim of subverting common sense and morality, as well as undermine the ideals of masculinity in our culture. The 100% female writing staff are a bunch of man-haters, and every man working in the team are self-hating enablers. Pathetic. A sharp assertion demands evidence, so let's get providing. I'm gonna go through each male character in High Guardian Spice, and give you the gist of how they are presented in the show. A pattern is sure to manifest. Let's roll the tape all the way back to the first scene of the series. Here's Rosemary's father and older brother, giving their full contribution to the narrative. A whole year away from Old Pebble, Rosemary. We're really gonna miss you. Oh, I'm glad you're wearing the locket. Your mom would be so proud of you. Would be? Mom is proud of you. That is it. That's all they get. Their only function in the show is to tell the protagonist and the audience that she is awesome, and that her mother, the strong and famous and bestest ever guardian lady, is sure to be proud of her. They aren't proud of her, her absent mother is proud of her, because of course, the opinion of males is secondary, if even that. The show goes for a double dip half an episode later. Rosie, your mom helps to right wrongs. Plus, she gets to lug around that humongous sword. Even in Rosemary's dreams, her family is merely a bunch of cheerleaders, stating just how magnanimous and powerful the most important person in the family is. That being the mother. This is literally every single spoken line by these two in the entire show. In the flashback later on, the father says nothing, merely watching from the sidelines as the mother shares her wisdom to their offspring. It is never even alluded to how the rest of the family is coping after the sudden disappearance of the most important person in the world. We never see their grief, only Rosemary's loss has any narrative bearing. The male members of the family are not characters. They don't have hopes, or dreams, or personalities, or lives, or stories of their own. They are decorations at best. And mind you, we are talking about the family of the protagonist here. One would think that the origin of the main character held some significance, worth exploring in the form of the supporting cast. On the opposite side of the road, things are no better with Sage's father. High Guardian Academy doesn't just accept anyone you know. You girls will have to take advantage of every opportunity. Putting aside the blatant lie in that statement, this is the only time he speaks, or is present on screen, or is even mentioned. Sage never speaks about her father. She never dreads what he might think if she uses new magic. It's always about her mother. Much like with Rosemary, the father of the family is at most a prop attached to the mother. 
I swear if the writers thought they could get away with creating a world where women have children all on their own, they would have done it. I'm actually a bit surprised. The magic of this universe would surely excuse that plot contrivance. This is one of those rare cases where the writing staff showcases some restraint. You get that thing the hell away from me right this second. On the other hand, it would have been much harder to mock and vilify men if they didn't exist. As is the case with Parsley's family. The father is a traditional family man, hence evil and stupid and oppressive. He is the catalyst for the idiotic nonsense drama of episode 4, and the matter is not even patched up with him, but rather Parsley's mom. Of course the father can't be shown apologizing and being reasonable. That would mean writing a traditionally masculine man having some kind of decency and merit, maybe even growing as a person and atoning for their mistakes. And that is far too steep a task for a writer who openly hates all men. The flock of brothers are also interchangeable and worthless and dumb. They need Pixie's Parsley to rescue them. And apparently Parsley was fine growing up on her own with no siblings to babysit her. Because she is so much better than all of them, naturally. Out of the four main girls, Fime is the only one with a father figure who has some merit. He is shown to be a revered member of the elf community, and rather heroically, he remains behind amidst the rot infested woods while his family flees to safety. The man gets to be the paragon of virtue, and the target of his daughter's admiration. Remarkably, a man doing something plot related, not presented as useless or evil. That is fantastic, coming from the pen of modern day agenda driven intersectional feminist spinster brigade. Oh right, but he has that melanin factor going for him, but of course. Gotta remember those rules of representation. As is the case with Hakone, the battle class teacher. He is coincidentally the only other traditionally masculine character who gets to actually do anything, while presented as competent. To be absolutely clear, he is far from competent. Everyone in this show is an idiot at the end of the day, but the show claims that he is competent. As a taste of his spectacular failures, he lets his students spar with real weapons against one another on the same day they pick them up. Someone is going to kill their classmate, and it's going to happen soon. Additionally, exactly like his fellow professors at the academy, his guidance is often non-existent, and when it isn't non-existent, it is absolutely baffling how misguided and idiotic it is. <laughs> Snapdragon, this is your father's weapon. It is. There are times when the weapon one inherits is not inherently best suited to them. <laughs> hmm. I mean, I should stick with the axe. I don't want to tarnish his legacy. Snapdragon, it can be painful to let go of the identity others expect you to manifest. But what of your legacy, young guardian? You must play to your strengths. Mm. Ah! Whoa. How about earning your keep and teaching Snapdragon to actually use the axe, you miserable Mr. Miyagi wannabe piece of shit? It's a precious family heirloom, you don't just hand it over to someone else. Obviously, the reason Snapdragon can't use it effectively is that he has the build of al dente spaghetti. That's just how muscles work, you know. Athleticism is the prerequisite for armed combat. Make him drop down and give you 24 starters. Jesus Christ, this isn't rocket science. But hey, no biggie. Snapdragon can just use a rapier, because handling a rapier is something you can pick up immediately and requires no training or discipline or muscle mass. All you fencing enthusiasts out there, you heard it here first. You are all ninnies, and your sport is a joke. Now obviously, the absolute triumph of Hakone as a character is when he steps in ready to scold Aster and defend the honor of his female students. And after Parsley fucking annihilates Aster's foot, seriously, he's lucky if he walks again. Professor Shaq Fu here does nothing but smirks along, 
even though one of his students just physically assaulted their classmate. Justice? The rules should be becoming clear. White hetero male bad, black hetero male possibly good, for as long as they act like good little feminist allies. To be fair, this same courtesy is extended to white male characters as well, as long as they spend each and every moment of their existence validating the female cast, such is the case with Parsley Smithing Teacher, whose only function in the story is to tell Parsley just how fantastic she is. Similarly, the creature known as Slime Boy is fine in the writer's eyes. He gets to hang around the school, never really doing anything, just existing, looking pathetic and weak, sounding like a cat getting smushed by a road roller. And when he sings, he sounds even worse. You asked him to pour peas down your shirt. Adjacent to him is Parnell, the other creature that just exists. He is introduced as a disgusting wimp, literally crying, because bullying. And yet, he is apparently the bestest ever, as seen on the obstacle course. I need you to know something. What's that, Pernell? I am very good at all of this. I believe you. Thank you. How did you know you'd bounce? I didn't. But in general, I don't believe in oblivion. Want some trail mix? Come on, just roll on your back when you get to the top. Yes! Yippee! That's it! We finished the course! I wonder if we're the first. You shot for the moon and nailed it, kid. <sighs> I feel like I could melt bones with my mind. This pathetic dwarf shit is the fastest, strongest, most athletic, most intuitive student in the entire freshman class. Parsley and Parnell ace the course, getting a new record time. Parsley gets the first place by technicality, even though this was supposed to be a team exercise. And that is tragic, because there is a shiny trophy. And it would have been really super duper neat if Parnell had won the trophy instead of Parsley. And why is there even a trophy for this random obstacle course in the first place? For the first year class? The first time any of them even see the damn thing. This show is a fever dream. Parsley concedes the win to Parnell by assaulting Aster. Thus getting points deducted? And that is great. Parnell is the writer's wet dream. A victimized, wimpy, effeminate creature who is black, has no interest in girls, and is at once better and stronger than all the other students, including obviously buffer traditional male students, who by all logic and laws of fucking physics, should be better in physical activities. And the bullying he has suffered is never shown, by the by. It just exists in one episode, off screen, and is ignored for the rest of the show's duration. Parnell isn't hindered by the alleged physical and emotional torture in any way. It's just scattershot garbage writing, pure and simple. The characters are what they are. Morphing from scene to scene to fit whatever the writers wish to barf on screen. It's not even any kind of underdog rises above all expectations kind of deal. Apparently, Parnell is supposed to be some kind of prodigy, being only 10 years old in an academy where everyone else are teenagers. It's not even stated in the show. You have to go to the wiki to find this nugget of info. Yes, this trash fire has a dedicated wiki. And without it, 
I could never tell. All the characters are so childish in design and conduct. I would have honestly believed if the show said everyone is 10 years old. Also, those are the dumbest bladed weapons I have ever seen. Anyone who uses those, go fuck yourself. Sword? Sickle? Pick one. Callum is Parnell's relative and alleged tormentor. A brutish, mean, homophobic, transphobic, meritless piece of shit. He's a real jerk. He's basically Aster 2.0. Even his dark complexion won't save him from the one-dimensional evil bully jock fuckhead archetype. His crimes against the intersectional feminist religion are just so severe. We'll go through those in due time. In the meantime, to protect the world from the scourge of standards and common sense, we have Caraway, an absolute cretin and unforgivably incompetent moron. That's what actually happens on screen. But as far as the show wishes to present him, he's the bestest teacher ever, and the epitome of everything a human being should be. After all, he is the creator's self-insert. There is no debating the fact. He goes so far as to voice act the fucker. That's how deep the mindless self-indulgence goes. The trans man is the greatest man who ever lived. The wisest kindest, strongest, most talented person ever. He's also apparently an absolute stud, a sex beast oozing unparalleled charisma. <laughs> Hello, again? <laughs> Girls, sorry. Caraway and Alo have ended up in the same costume four years in a row. At least you're not dressed as cats. I've seen a million here. So boring. How do you guys and Professor Bunny know each other? Oh. We, uh... We go to the same parties. I'm far past giving this show anything resembling benefit of the doubt. So in all cases where information is given this vaguely, I am assuming the most ridiculous interpretation. So apparently, Caraway has such an utterly magnificent sexual aura that he has casual threesomes with lesbian couples in his free time. The creator wrote their own sexual fantasy into the show. The absolute depravity. And speaking of our fantasies written into the show, Snapdragon is Caraway's ginger alt coloring. Out of all the students, he's surely gonna be the bestest ever one day. You may be confused by that assertion. Isn't he an asshole? A friend of Amaryllis? And a bully? Ah yes, you see, that's gonna be ignored going forth. Never mentioned again. The show treats him like a decent guy who's never done anything wrong and never will do anything wrong. He's part of that pathetic creature club that just exists and are allowed to exist and given screen time even while having nothing to offer to the narrative. In fact, he's the only character given anything resembling an arc in the entire show despite the fact that he isn't even one of the main four. Don't misunderstand, it's absolute garbage but also clear favoritism nonetheless. But why, you ask? What makes him so special? Well, the tiny fact that Snapdragon wants to cut off his dick and become a girl instead. I'll go through the details once the time is ripe, but for now, suffice to say Snapdragon's story is the show's core thesis slapping the audience brazenly in the face. Traditional masculinity, and femininity for that matter, is evil. Every male should grow up to be a girl, and every female should grow up to be a boy. Snapdragon's family are nothing but oppressive bullies, and his father is the manifestation of everything wrong with the male sex, and pure evil. Even though everything he says and does is 100% correct. Oh, and then there are some idiots scheming to take over the world. Destroy the world, kill people, trying to... something... evil? I guess they are the bad guys. They are all incompetent, flat, and unintimidating, and cartoony, and they are impossible to take seriously. And the only female villain of the show gets redeemed eventually. Who saw that one coming? And there you have it. The ideal man is wimpy, effeminate, has no sex drive, 
and stays out of the way of the stunning and brave female cast, while showering them with praise. And the most worthwhile men are those who openly hate their penises, or conversely are late adopters, and if you happen to fit the traditional white heteromasculine male mold in any degree, your two choices are either to be brushed aside, or to be the literal villain. That's the extent of nuance as far as characterization is concerned in this show. Every story carries the philosophy of the author, the way they see the world, and the ideals they wish to insert into the world. In the case of High Guardian Spice, this fantasy is all about a bunch of cunt huffing pieces of human filth turning their dreams of revenge towards the male sex into an animated disaster and passing it off as entertainment. And the bashing doesn't stop at mere characterization. It's not a coincidence that when Amaryllis shoots up the schoolyard, the only students caught in the blasts are boys. It's not a coincidence that not a single heterosexual relationship is shown blossoming in the show. It's not a coincidence that there doesn't exist a single instance in this 12 episode series where two male characters have a conversation amongst themselves. I'm not kidding, not a single scene escapes the vagina folk. I don't need to tell you that this is a statistical impossibility. This does not happen by accident, it's crafted on purpose. This is not up for conversation, there is nothing to debate here. This show and its creators hate the male sex, the very concept of masculinity, and wish to see it eradicated. The message is blatantly clear. And as always, a huge thanks to each of you for listening till the end. For liking, subbing, commenting, it's all appreciated. And a special thank you goes to my supporters on Patreon. And an extra special thanks to my 10 euro patron Wyland. If you would like to join these fine people, or check out my other creative stuff, all the links are down below. Take care everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.